All right. Um, okay, so we got a few people here. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is our uh, usual kind of hackathon sessions. Um, so some people were asking about, I, I, I mostly um, am planning on just having one of these a week on Mondays at 11. So that should be in the schedule. I know I had a, had a few uh, wrong or extra ones, but but um, we had two on the first week just to try and get some extra stuff in on Tuesday to get people going. I am always happy to, um, you know, if, if you need to just email me, we can set up a Zoom session one-on-one -on -one or, or even face-to-face. -face. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not in the 355 lab today. Uh, actually, um, uh, Amy hasn't joined us yet. She's over there. Uh, hopefully she'll be joining us in a second. So, I, I, and I am planning on usually doing these face-to-face -face in the lab if you do need to, to come in um, and, uh, and, and talk with me in person um, on Mondays. Um, but uh, today I've got something going on here. If, um, if I have to pause, um, I've got a service person coming. So, so if he comes right in the middle of this, I might have to pause for a bit and I'll apologize in advance for that. So, um, all right, so let's go ahead and get going. Um, so as usual, you know, if you have questions, um, feel free to ask at any time or chat them out. Uh, my agenda, I had a, I wanted to maybe spend 15 minutes on talking about a few things on assignment one, and then we'll spend the rest of time um, uh, on the pro on, on unit two stuff, the problem set maybe for a few minutes, and then the assignment two um, for, for our second unit, okay? Um, so, first of all, I think I'm, I'm going to try to um, um, resist the urge to take too long on this, but um, there's a lot of things that would really help people um, if you know some of the basics of um, of like using the, the Linux command line. I'm gonna go talk a few about those here because I wanna talk a little bit about running the unit tests and, and actually the simulations in general that we're building for our assignments. So, um, although again, I'll point out under our course, under the additional resources, I've got some links to things. So in particular, if, if you do have some time, um, I mean, I think, I think everybody um, in, in a computer science undergraduate degree program really should learn a little bit about using a uh, command line and Unix shell. Um, I've got two resources I, re I, I, I recommend highly. Um, there's um, a, uh, a written based tutorial from this group called Software Carpentry on the Unix shells, which they've got about two or three uh, hours of web pages of, of um, uh, tutorial things on, Unix, on using the Unix shell. Uh, very good, recommend it. Uh, also, there's a course from MIT about, uh, they call it the missing CS semester. It's kind of like everything that that they wish that their undergraduate sort of knew about tools and techniques and concepts and things. So they go over stuff like the Unix shell and also Git um, and revision control systems and stuff like that. It's also an excellent, if you've got some time to look at those, the very first two or three videos are about using uh, command line environments like the Unix shell. So very good resources to look through. Um, all right. Um, I've already got my dev box up and running. Um, and um, like I said, I wanted to show a few things about uh, the, the first assignment. So let me go ahead and get that first assignment open. So as usual, if you have it running, you should always do uh, an open folder for the particular assignment that you wanna work on. Um, so in our sync assignment, assignment one. Uh, So uh, remind me, so um, when, when I get to talking about assignment two, I want to remind people again about um, the, the issues that we had, but we didn't quite have your dev box completely set up. So I need to revisit that, the, getting your, the .vs code and the .c lang format, right? So if, if you're still having those issues, so for the first one, if you don't have your .vs code, uh, the keyboard shortcuts, control shift one to do a make clean, control shift two to do a make all, those keyboard shortcuts 
types won't work among other things if you if if the VS code isn't configured correctly. Uh, and then the other thing that I've been pointing out, if you don't have the .clang form, the correct .clang format file, which uh, people on Windows were having problems because I had things misconfigured and we're using some symbolic links. But um, an easy way to check that is if you put opening braces on the ends of lines and you do a save, if it doesn't automatically always put your opening curly braces on a new line indented correctly for the level, then you're you're not running the code formatter style checker um, on save as you should be, as, as it's supposed to be configured to do. So, okay. Um, you know, like I said, uh, let, let me move on. So uh, this will just be a, a touching a few things as usual. You know, um, if you have questions, um, um, shout them out. Um, I wanted to. There, there were a few people that had some questions about actually using the the uh, simulation and um i think oh i should have i should have put my um i should have put the um um solution on here i probably i probably have the original starting code here um i'm going to configure a few things i would actually reinstalled my dev box here there's a couple things i don't like and for me personally i don't find this uh, mini map over here useful um so um, you can disable that mini map if you look for the editor, if you look in your settings and look for the mini map, and get rid of that if you like. Um, and personally, I've also come to like dark themes. Uh, so probably a lot of you already discovered this, but um, pretty easy to also add in the, uh, new themes. If you look through your, the extensions, there are tons and tons of themes but I tend to go using dark themes nowadays for different things. Um, and then the other thing, I think I tried to show this before, I was having some problems, but um, um, the outline is a very useful thing to use um, on the code in Visual Studio Code. So in particular, instead of like searching through or scrolling through for things, um, like if I wanna bring up the outline, um, I can just look for like, Initialized memory. Yeah, so I've still got my original code here. Um, let me, because um, I really do want to have my get the solution here. Give me a second. I'm going to get my solution in here. Uh, so I had posted solutions uh, for these. Uh, let me see where did, I, where did I have that solution? I don't know if I remember. Um, Uh, give me a moment. I gotta remember where did I put that? Uh, oh, there it Um, well, I guess maybe I better just download it. Um, um, so yeah, I had posted example solutions. Get rid of that. Bring down run, I guess. Okay, uh, now I got the solution, I hope. Let me check here. Yeah, there we go. Um, so let's try and build this and run it. Um,
Yeah, oops. Put on quite the right ones. It might have been uh, somebody's uh, somebody's uh, work that they were that I was helping them with. Let's try this one here. Um, Oh, there we go. Okay, so I got the one, the right one. Sorry, I should have had that set up beforehand. I forgot about that. Um, okay, so I've got kind of the example solution that I posted here. Uh, all the unit tests are passing. Um, so, but these are really meant to be run from the command line. Um, so um, I wanted to just mention real quickly, like for a few minutes here. Um, so again, it would be useful if you go through like a, a, a full or kind of tutorial and using uh, the command line. But let's let's open up a terminal here. Um, so um, real quickly, one or two things. So, so all commands that you run from a command line, um, they, they usually take um, what are known as, as flags and command line options. So for example, a basic command that you use is the ls command to list the files in your current directory. And, and I'm currently in, so this is my current directory, pwd says your, tells you what your current directory is. So uh, I'm in my home directory, uh, the vagrant user in my dev box, and then I'm in the, the subdirectory sync assignment, assignment one. So that's my current working directory and pwd prints out your working directory. And when you, when you do an ls, by default, it lists the files in your current directory, all right? So um, all commands on the command line take um, flags that you can use. For example, most all commands have like a help flag. Um, so there's two dashes and then help to get, for example, the help for the, the directory listing command, right? Um, and um, this gives you the basic information about how to use this command, the, the ls command, list information about files. Um, so, some of the most important information about commands from the command line are all of the um, options or the flags that they support. Okay, And there's two different types of options or flags um, for commands. There's short options and long options. So short options will always have a single dash uh, and then a single letter. Um, and then long options always have two dashes and then they have, you know, like a, a full word or maybe a couple of words with, with single dash in between them, right? A lot of options have both a short and a long flag. So for example, um, the uh, human readable, dash A, dash A H is often the, the short option to get help, dash H or dash dash help. But for the LS command, the dash H is used for giving human readable um, options. Um, another uh, useful command, I use dash A, uh, dash all, uh, or dash capital A, dash, dash almost all a lot, because LS only gives you the names of the files. Um, so I usually like to use the dash A or the dash capital A. Um, um, or, or sorry, the, the, um, before I talk about the dash A, uh, another one that I, I wanted to talk about first was the dash L, um, use a long listing format. So that, that's what I wanted to start with. So um, dash L, instead of just listing uh, the names of the files, you get each file on a separate line. So L, you can think of as listing them on per line, or also you can think of them as, as giving a long description. Um, so besides the name of the file, you get the permissions of the file, the owner of the file, and the size of the file, and the, the last, the date when the file was created, that type of thing. And then I always, I often combine that with dash A. 
uh, because some files like with, with a dot in front of them are hidden, so you won't normally see those, but, but these are usually used for configuration information, like our .vs code or the .clang format. So if you're wondering why those files are missing, it's because normally they're hidden from you unless you use the dash A option, all right? Um, and also, by the way, these short options, um, you can put multiple of them together. So, uh, so you'll often, if you run these tutorials, see people combine multiple options just with a single dash and then listing out them. So if I want to do a long listing of all files, but I'll use the capital A, so this will exclude the current directory and the, the parent directory, which I don't find useful having in my long listings. And we'll use that dash H to get human readable, right? So, so this, this is kind of a common way that I look at my files from the command line in, in a directory. Uh, human readable just change this so that these are in megabytes and kilobytes instead of in just bytes. Um, and in fact, um, as I do these videos, um, um, I often just use an alias. Uh, so alias is a way of making a name that whenever you use that that name, it always runs the other command. So um, I do directory listing so often that I find it very um, um, efficient to have just a single letter D to do my most common thing, which is to do a um, um, IAS. Do a um, a long listing with uh, showing all files, including hidden ones, with the human readable um, file formats again. All right, so that's all I'm going to say about command line arguments. Uh, or, well, actually, these are command line flags or options. Um, so, and then about command line arguments. Um, so, the ls command allows, if, if you don't give it any arguments or flags, by default, it lists the current directory. So both my ls or my d command, um, uh, my d alias are listing the files in my current directory. But you can give a command line option for d. For example, uh, I could use a absolute path name. So if I want to list all my files in my home directory, I can do a directory listing my d alias on home vagrant. This is an absolute path because it goes all the way from root. So if on, on the root of the file system, there's a subdirectory called home and under home, there's a subdirectory called vagrant, which holds the files for our DevBox vagrant user. So by giving that command line um, parameter here, um, it actually lists the files in my home directory, all right? Or you can use relative path names as a command line option. So for the ls command, so for example, if I want to see all the files in my, my parent directory, dot dot is short for the parent directory. So if I want to see all the files in my assignment directory, which is one up from my current directory, assignment one, I can do D on dot dot. So those are all the files in assignment one. If I want to go two levels up, I can say dot 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 dot. So that's the parent of my parent. So back to the sync directory. All right, so anyway, that, that last thing that I just did I basically did this command, ls dash a dash l dash h on dot dot slash dot dot. And so we had three command line um, flags here to modify the behavior of the uh, ls command. So give me all the files, excluding the, 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 the current directory and the parent directory, the dot and the dot dot. Give me a long listing, um, give them to me in human readable format, and then my command line parameter was uh, list the files that are two directory levels up from my current directory. Okay, so I, I went over that hopefully relatively quickly because um, um, all of the, the, the tools that we build here, so, so when you do a build, you actually build two executables, the, the sim executable and the test executable. These are both, these both work as command line tools. Um, so in fact, so getting back to our assignments, um, um, the, 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 the sim, the actual simulation that, you're, that we build and run for our assignments uh, is built using the um, assignment one sim.cpp. 
So you can kind of see how these command line arguments are parsed. Uh, it's a real simple example in, in all of the things we build for this class. But um, um, so, so first of all, uh, like using the, the, the help um, from the LS, um, our, um, our SIMs, um, if, if you don't specify any, if you don't specify the correct command line arguments, it gives you this usage message to kind of tell you how to use the command. So, so you can try that out. So to wait to run, to run SIMs, you have to say, to run these by hand, you have to do a dot slash. Um, so if you've ever wondered about that, um, basically, so this is a little bit of an aside, but um, there's an environment variable called path. This is what is searched. These directories are searched whenever you type a command on the command line to find the command to run. So, um, so remember when we were setting up our dev box, uh, you can ask for the which command. So the which, so ls actually lives in user bin directory, which is on my path, which is why I can just type ls uh, and do directory list of ls. But um, my current directory, um, home vagrant sync assignment assignment one is not on my path. So if you just run sim, um, it can't, it won't find it because sim is not in any of these directories that's searched on my path for commands to run from the command line, right? So you can always specify a full name to um, a program to run. So I could say uh, home vagrant sync um, assignment, assignment one, uh, sim. If I wanted to run the sim, but that's a lot of typing, but, but that will actually run it, right? Or you can use a relative path name. So since, since sim is in my current directory, I can say in my current directory, which is dot slash find and run the sim program. So that's what that dot slash is doing. So instead of adding all of these assignment directories into our path, um, we just have to specify either the full, the full path to the command that we want to run, or you can use a relative path name like dot slash sim. All right. So, anyway, so back to the command line. The, 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 the sim command, it doesn't take any command line uh, flags like dash h or dash l, but it does expect three command line parameters, or sorry, two command line parameters. So sim is the name of the program, and then uh, we have to give the max cycles and then the file of the simulation uh, that we want to run with our simulator, all right? Um, and if you're interested, um, the way that that is done is we, 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 we parse what are known as the command line arguments. So you can pass in these command line arguments to your main function. So when I do something like sim and I run, want to run for 100 cycles, and I, I want to run the the simulation file that's in my sim files directory called, um, what was it, um, program 01.sim, for example. So, so these, um, I'm passing in my two uh, command line arguments, uh, 100 for max cycles and the name of the, the sim file, which is sim file slash program 01.sim uh, that I wanna run the simulation on, all right? And the way these are parsed, um, so when, whenever you, you pass in command line arguments. Um, argc will be the number of command line arguments. So actually it, it counts the name of the program as um, one of the command line arguments. So, so if I pass in arguments like this, argc is actually gonna be three, okay? So, so the way that, that our simulation program is working is that if argc is not exactly three, we just print that usage message, which is how we got this usage method here. But if it is three, then it expects that um, um, argv0 then is gonna, um, so, so what the bash shell does is it, it actually uses white space to um, parse out, uh, you know, to separate out command line arguments, right? So everything before the first white space it detects is gonna be an argv0. And, so, and that should, so that should be the name of the program. And then, oops, and then everything uh, from the second command line argument, so after the first set of white space, but before the second set of white space will be an argv1, right? 
So that's how we pull out RB1. We expect that to be something that we can interpret as an integer, uh, which is the number of maximum cycles performed for the simulation here. Uh, and then RB2, which is our third command line argument, we expect to be the name of a, uh, of a, of a file that we can open and read from. All right. So, um, Anyway, so that's how you know, that that was all kind of a prelude to how you can run these um, simulations by hand. So, um, when for assignment two, once you build the sim, you can just run the sim from the command line to get the usage message to find out all the command line parameters. But usually, the command line parameters are similar to this. You have to give maybe one or two other command line options, follow, and then the last thing is going to be the name of the simulation file that that you take as input for the simulation uh, like um, and, and all of our simulation files are in the sim files subdirectory um, for all of our assignments so like program 01.sim for example all right so you notice this is a typical command line program so what it does is um, um, it sends all of its output to standard output so all tools that run from the command line um, accept things from standard input, you know, like, like typing at the keyboard is normally the standard input. And then it sends all the output to standard output by default as do the simulations that we build for this uh, assignment, right? So in this case, like if we look at program 01.sim, um, this was our initial simulation where we had these instructions in memory 300, 301, 302 for our hypothetical simulator. Um, and the program start, counter started at 300. So when we first executed fetch, we fetched from a memory location 300. Um, that was a 1940. So a one was a load. So that this is a load from memory address 940. So the result should have been that the, the value in memory address 940 got loaded from there into the accumulator. And so on. So you can step through these by hand, right? Um, all right. And as far as the unit tests go, um, you can also run the unit tests by hand. Um, uh, no, sorry, the system tests by hand. You can run both the unit tests, which is what the test file is. I'll talk about that in a second here. Um, and also the system tests by hand. Um, if you want to, but but um, these are run when you do the make test. So, so I just ran all the system tests by hand. When you do the make test, it runs both the um, the unit test by calling the dot test, and it also runs the if the unit tests all pass, then it runs the system test. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned for my announcement for the first assignment, um, some people had everything passing on the unit test, but had just two system tests failing. Um, and, um, and you'll want to know about this because I think for this assignment, starting with assignment two, you, you will have to, to do a few things to get the unit test to pass as well. So in that case, basically, um, um, it was because um, the, the unit test expect exactly a line for line output to be the same between when you run the code that you create um, and the corresponding um, result file. Okay, so um, I just ran program 01.sim, and in sim files, there's a file called program 01.result, which is the expected correct output that the system tests are expecting, right? Um, so, so let me just kind of show you um, what. If you didn't experience this yourself, what those students were seeing. So, so if you had uh, an error message, I think on translate or uh, maybe on um, initialized memory, maybe it was translate address. Let's try it. And I'll just make the, 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 the error message slightly different there. 
rebuild by hand here from the command line. So we'll do make. Um, so again, notice so it only rebuilt the file that I modified, um, and then it relinked both the test executable and the sim executable. Um, so so yeah, so for um, I just ran the program three. So notice um, on purpose, program three is um, performing a uh, you know there, there's a, a reference to an invalid. Um, uh, memory address here so so yeah our um memory only goes from anyway so so so, so we are expecting an error message here right um and if you look at the um program three results um you know so it was expecting this error message here. So you, you can try this out. So if, if you are failing, so now if I run my, my unit, sorry, my system test, um, I should see the same kind of thing that, that those students were seeing, that three and four are failing. Uh, and so here's some more command line stuff. So um, if I want to, if I want to do the same difference that the system tests are doing here, uh, we can use what's known as um, I.O. redirection. So I can use the, the right arrow. So instead of having the output from running the simulation go to standard output, I can redirect it into a file. So um, call it my program 03.result. OK, oh, uh, except for. Um, all these error messages always get sent out to standard um, error instead of standard output. So notice that, that even though I redirected it, I still had some output on my terminal because the um, error messages are getting sent to the standard error stream. Okay, so, so there's two streams, um, standard output and standard error normally on a command line terminal. They can be redirected separately. So if I wanna have both the standard output redirected and the standard error redirected. So the, the two less arrow there, two less arrow is a name for standard error. So I could redirect my standard error to a different file like that, right? So now the error messages will be in my error file dot result. Or um, if I wanna have both of those directed to the same file, um, um, you should use the two out and one. So what this will do is it'll redirect standard output to the my program three result, and then the two out and one will also redirect the standard error out to whatever the standard output is being re redirected to. Right. Anyway, so the result of that little command line um, option there is that. Um, um, if we look at the context, content of my program three result, um, we've got all of the output from running the simulation um, on program three, including the different error messages, right? And then finally, like to do the same thing that the system tests are doing, I could just do a diff. So the diff is another command line tool. Um, and I, I could find the difference between my program three results and the program three results um, in the sim files, right? Um, and you, as you can see here, what this is saying is that there's the only difference is on line 131 um, in um, the first file here, which was my results, uh, the, the line on 131 read like this, which had that slightly different error message there. Whereas the second file um, that we did the diff on, the line on 131 read this, right? So, so this is the first file kind of has the left arrow difference, and then the second file is gonna be the right arrow difference from this diff command here. All right, so um, anyway, so this is all useful stuff to know for working with um, these. We're basically building command line tools, the, the simulation, uh, the, the simulators that we run for the assignments. Um, and um, the, also the test unit. Yeah, this 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 video will be um, uploaded as usual. So, uh, cat function. Somebody asked about the cat function. Cat. Here's another thing. Uh, besides using dash help, 
um, which gets you kind of a pretty terse information about cat. Another command to get information is the man command. This, is, this stands for manual pages. So if you do man, it actually puts it out into a pager. So to, to go through the pager, I can use up and down arrow, um, or I can use spacebar to, 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 to go by pages, or you can use page up and page down. And then when you want to exit out of here, yeah, use Q to quit, to exit out of there. Okay, so man, so cat is just to concatenate files um, and print on standard output. So a lot of people use cat in order to display the contents of a file to standard output. You can do lots of stuff with cat, uh, but I but I often just think of it as so you know. Think of it as just printing a file to standard output. Um, all right. So anyway, that's cat. Um, I'll put a link. Um, um, well, besides the the software carpentry um, tutorial that I mentioned, um, I've got another good sort of summary of command line, basic command line tools like ls cat, find and things like that, which would be good one basic ones to know. So I'll I'll, I'll put that in in the additional resources as well when we're done here. So. Um, Okay, and then um, one final thing, um, I did want to also talk a little bit about debugging your programs um, a little bit. So it's useful if your program is crashing. Um, um, here's a couple of hints about program about about debugging, uh, especially if your program is, is crashing for like some memory corruption. So if you're getting a segmentation violation or something like that. And in fact, I think I'm going to um, add. Um, let's do. Let's put a division by zero in somewhere here. Um, let's say in executing add. Uh, we have a division by zero here, right? Uh, oh, I was going to detect it here on my make. Huh, didn't know it was that smart. Um, see if I can detect it if I put it in a variable. All right, so we have a division by zero. So that normally causes a program crash. Okay, so it's not as serious as a memory corruption, but um, if we run the program, um, like using our unit test. So I can run the unit test from the command line, kind of the same way that I ran the simulation using the dot slash. Um, oh, I guess we're not running in the simulations. Um, Yeah, we thought we would have hit that in our unit test there. Uh, uh, I must be optimizing that out or something. Um, Well, let's, okay, I'll do something a little bit more dangerous. Let me, um, surprise that didn't work, but. Um, so we'll do an ob obvious bounds error here. So this should cause memory corruption because um, most all the time, um, so anytime we call the execute add, um, I'm doing something into my memory. But normally we have a lot less than memory sizes of 10,000 for all of our simulations. Um, so, so we're writing something way beyond the bounds of memory here. So that should cause crashes pretty often. Oops.
help build that. Uh, huh. Okay, I'm surprised that's not crashing. Maybe I just need to put it in somewhere where let's use a lot more than add for it to. Um, let's put it into. Why don't I shoot? Um, I just add an assertion here. That should cause a break. Um, I'm going to trouble getting it to uh, to uh, throw an exception or something. Um, Okay. Um, well, let, let's move on. Um, so we should have had that worked out ahead of time. Um, I guess we could um, throw an exception maybe where we're not. Um, so uh, um, so as I've been kind of doing with these, um, Um, I'll get back to that here. I, I, I need to. I, need, I do need to figure out a way to, to to get it to. So we have an error here, so we can have an example of doing this. But um, so these unit tests um, um, are also a command line program. Um, so if you do find that you're having an exception, um, or uh, sorry, like if, if your program is crashing, like uh, some sort of segmentation violation or something like that. One useful thing to do, so like all these, I think you can use like dash H if you want to get some help um, um, from your um, from running the unit test from the command line, um, the different kinds of flags that you can do. But a useful one is to um, show the successful tests. Okay, so when you run the unit tests um, or when you run them using the the the, the keyboard shortcut, Control Shift Three, 
it just runs the tests uh, with the default. Um, and this only shows the successful tests, right? So if all the tests are passed and you don't get anything except for a, a summary. Um, I'm sorry, it only shows failing tests uh, by default. So, so if you run it, if no tests are failing, you don't get really any anything, right? So if you use the, the dash S flag, um, this will show both failing and succeeding tests. Um, so you get all the tests. The reason why this is helpful is um, if your program is crashing, um, some memory corruption or double free error or something like that, the very first thing you need to know is you need to know the actual last line of code that was executed before that crash occurred, okay? So one way you can do that using the unit test is if you if you run all and display all the tests, including the successful ones using the dash S flag, then you'll be able to see exactly which is the last line, which is the last test that ran before you get your uh, crash, before you get your error message for the program crashing, okay? which is very useful because usually, uh, even for, for tough to find bugs, um, the, the, the last test that you're running is the one that's, that, that's most likely directly or almost directly causing the crash. So, so if you know what that test is, then you can go and look at that, that code. Um, Right. Um, so let's see here. Um, there's got to be some way I can make this. Uh, that definitely should fail the test, right? Am I doing something wrong when I'm saving these? Because I'm not putting anything in the correct place if I put it to the negative of the of the index or the negative of the real address here. Um, there we go. At least we get some fail. Oh, there we go. So finally, I got something that caused a segmentation violation. All right. So, uh, so this is a well. Um, at least I can finally illustrate what I was trying to get at. So, so this is a common thing if you have some memory corruption, okay? So, and part of the reason why we use like C and C++ in the classes. So whenever you're trying to do dynamic memory management, um, I mean, that's both a powerful thing, but it's very easy to accidentally corrupt memory or do things that you, you don't want to do. But yeah, I mean, part of that is... Uh, it's good to uh, actually at least once uh, in, in, in a class have to write programs where you have to learn and struggle with dynamic, with managing memory by hand like this, okay? Um, so, um, so yeah, in this case, you know, going to line 151 of my test, which is the last failing test I saw, might not really be a good indication of, um, of the um, problem here, right? So we can look at line 151 of my tests here. Um, so, um, So these were all failing because um, well, I mean, you know, a lot of all of these are failing because I'm no longer poking things to the putting things to the correct place. Uh, so the first failing test was all the way back at 108 here, right? Um, but um, yeah, so anyway, back to this. So um, if we do look at the uh, add the dash s flag on there. Um, well, in this case, it doesn't give us a lot of extra information. So it actually did get to um, um, 152 um, before the, the segmentation violation occurred here. So, um,
Okay. Um, so yeah, I should probably move on here, but um, um, this can help, you know, so, so this can help narrow down when, when you're having different kinds of, of crashes here. So that's usually the first thing that I do is, is put that in and try and find the actual last line of code uh, and work backwards from there, so. Um, Okay, let's, um, yeah, let's, so, so I did want to talk a little bit about assignment two here. So let me go ahead and move to that unless somebody wants to ask some more questions about, about it. This is all, all stuff that will be, you know, um, useful for the, the, the future assignments too, and as well, you know, so getting more familiar with using the command line and then debugging problems like this and stuff like that, so. Um, Let me really quickly though, let me see if there's anybody who has a question about the written problem set here. Um, so, um, So for our unit two, um, we're, we're looking at chapters three and four on processes and threads, right? So um, there's just two questions, although both of them are kind of multi-part questions. Um, so the second one might take you a bit longer than the first one. Um, so the first one is asking to think about, um, in chapter three, we talk about processes and this, uh, the idea about process states. Um, so you need to learn about um, you know the, the different um, kind of generic idea of process states. So in particular, the ready running block cycle. So our second assignment, we're really implementing um, a round robin queuing system in order to simulate processes being managed uh, going through ready running and block states. Okay. Uh, but yeah, besides those, um, also the, 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 the seven state process diagram for our chapter three extends. So, so there's this idea, there's this difference between um, uh, processes that are currently in memory versus processes that have been swapped out or also called processes, suspended processes. Okay, so you ought to make certain that you understand, you know, what it means, process swapping or process suspension, right? So an operating system that, that supports doing process swapping might select certain processes to be swapped out of memory in order to free up main memory for other processes to use it. So um, operating systems that do that um, typically then will have um, process states for swapped out processes that co correspond to ready and blocked, but for but for swapped out processes, so you'll have like a, a block suspended state and a and a ready suspended state. Right. So this question anyway kind of asks you. So you have to understand process suspension, um, and you have to at, uh, understand the idea of of um, process states um, and um, if we have a, a scheduler, a dispatcher, which is kind of like what we're simulating for our assignment two here. Um, and um, if, um, um, so we described kind of two policies, right? So, we should always, um, the, our dispatcher should either always dispatch from a process in the ready state to minimize swapping, or um, if we're using um, some sort of idea of priority, so some priority-based scheduler, um, another kind of extreme policy that you might uh, implement on, on a dispatcher like this is to always use the highest priority process, even if that process happens to be suspended out, okay? 
So, so on, on the, the first one, the, the, the drawback is that um, if we do have a high, higher priority process currently swapped out, um, it um, might not run for a while. So, um, so high priority processes, their priority might get ignored um, once they get swapped out, right? So it's kind of a disadvantage in that. But we avoid having to do um, maybe excessive swapping. So the other one then um, is that uh, if we always run the highest priority process, whether it's ready or, or ready suspended, um, then at least the priorities are being maintained, but uh, we might have to swap something back in before we're ready to do that. So, um, so anyway, I mean, there's no necessarily correct answer for this. So you, you can think of a lot of ways that you can maybe make an intermediate policy, something in between, right? So something that doesn't always just use process on the ready, or something that, all, that, that doesn't just always use um, the highest priority process, whether it's suspended or not suspended, right? So, so try and think about that a little bit um, and um, um, uh, see if you can come up with a good idea that would balance, you know, so, so not ignoring priorities completely, but um, not unnecessarily swapping all the time or, or over, swa over swapping things back in. Um, just as soon as, as, as it might happen to be the highest priority process. Um, now, the second question is uh, about uh, using threads. So I thought I would give just a quick explanation about this here, uh, about this program here. So this uses an actu actual um, um, code, uh, threading code from the POSIX pthreads library, right? So uh, real quickly, how this works is um, there's, there's a function called thread function, right? But we don't call this like a regular function. So we just, so like if you look in main, we don't have something where we just call thread function like, um, like a normal function. Instead, the way that thread function is used is we pass it as a parameter to um, this other function called pthread create, okay? So pthread create comes from the, the POSIX thread, pthreads library. And what this does, uh, again, this will make more sense once you read chapter four, if you haven't started reading about threads yet. But um, so normally when you run a program um, um, on Unix, on Linux, um, it starts it off with a single thread, right? And that single thread will be running the code from the main function onwards, right? So, 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 so the first line in the main will be the first line of code that's run um, in um, the, uh, the, the thread that's created when you first start running a program, right? So when you call pthread create, it adds, creates another thread and adds it to that process. So, right, so, so um, a process can have more than one thread in a multi-threaded system, as, as you'll learn about in chapter four. Um, so in this case, it creates a second thread, and that thread is going to be running the code that you give it in the function here. So now, after pthread, if, if pthread create returns successfully, so if it doesn't return successfully, we just abort. Uh, but if it does return successfully, at this point, there's actually two threads in this process. But the original thread is still running um, here in main, so it's going to end up running this loop. Um, and the new thread is going to be running um, the code here in thread function. Right? And those will be running in parallel uh, in the two threads here. Right? So with that, with that background in mind, then hopefully that's enough and also reading chapter four to kind of understand and be able to answer these questions. Make certain you explicitly answer all these questions for part one. So, um, you know, I kind of already discussed some of these, you know, so how is the pthread function run? So make certain you identify the differences between the, the, the thread fun the loops in the thread function and the main function and these other things, right? Um, all right, I think that's all I wanted to say about the problem set. Is there any questions on, on the problem set? So, um, 
And then for the second assignment, I already mentioned it a little bit, um, but um, so let me just give um, a quick description of what this simulation is doing for assignment two. So basically your task is to complete the, the simulation, which is a process state simulator. So basically we have to create a, uh, a process control block like we talk about in chapter three and chapter four to manage a set of processes. So, so this simulator simulates processes uh, going through ready, running, and blocked states um, in our system here, right? So it basically uh, simulates uh, a round robin um, process scheduler. So, um, so if you look at the sim files, let me bring up one of those for um, um, our um, assignment two here. This is the way these simulations work. Um, it shows off assignment one. And then open assignment two. So if you look at like one of the sim files here, it's just uh, each line has one of these uh, simulated events. So we have different events. So in, anytime a new occurs in the simulation, that means a new process needs to be created and added to the system, right? So if this first new is gonna create a process with a process identifier of one that needs to be added and put into the process control block and managed by the simulation, right? Um, and then um, um, a CPU event represents one clock tick, one, one CPU cycle, one simulated CPU cycle happening. So that's, that's how we simulate work being done by these processes. So we're simulating a single CPU system uh, in, in our assignment two here. So there's one, one CPU that might be currently running a process. Or, or the CPU could be idle if there's no process currently ready to run, okay? So with this, this assignment, you have to simulate creating new processes. Uh, and then whenever a CPU cycle happens, we, we describe this uh, in here, but um, whenever um, uh, a CPU cycle happens, for example, you have to check. So if, if my CPU is currently idle, um, I wanna look at the ready queue of, of processes and dispatch the next uh, ready process. So if there is one process or more ready, I take the processes at the front of the ready queue and make it the running process. Right. Uh, and likewise, you know, if, if, when we're simulating these CPU cycles, um, we're gonna be simulating doing time slicing. So what that means is that um, um, when the dispatcher runs a new process, selects a process to run, it'll only run for a certain number of CPU cycles before it times out, right? So I should have, um, uh, so if you look at our textbook in chapter three about the, the process state transition diagram, um, uh, if you're doing time slice quantums or time slicing um, a process, one way it can, can stop being the running process is if it times out. And in that case, it's gonna be returned back to the ready queue, right? So another thing that's happening on these CPU cycles is we need to keep track of the total number of cycles we've run on the, turn, the current time slice quantum. And if that exceeds the system time slice quantum, we have to time the process out and return it back to the end of the ready queue, all right? So besides dispatching processes to become the running process, and timing them out if they exceed their time slice quantum. Um, a process that's running could um, end up, we also simulate processes blocking and unblocking in the simulator, okay? So if while we're running a process, um, if one of these block events happens, the current running process, we simulate it um, blocking and waiting on IO. So we just have a generic um, IO or a generic event ID. 83 in this case. 
So if that happens, the process is going to transition from running to being blocked. So we'll have to be put on a list of blocked processes. Um, and, and we have to um, you know, keep track of what it's blocked waiting on. So in this case, whatever the running process was, um, it's blocked waiting on event 83 to occur before it um, goes back to being ready again, right? And then, you know, the corresponding for that is that um, if an unblock occurred, we have to look at all the, uh, the currently blocked processes on our blocked list um, and the, the process that's waiting on um, event 83, 83 should become unblocked and return back to the uh, ready queue. Right? And that's mostly it for these events. Um, and then one final one though, so we do have one final transition. So a process that's running, instead of timing out or becoming blocked, it could be that the process is finished, right? So um, it's done executing. So if a done occurs, whatever the running process is, it'll, it'll just exit the system basically, go to a done state or, or an exit state. Okay, um, all right, so uh, what time is it? That's 12.10 already. So um, let's look at the code real quickly. And then, you know, so your first task again, like the first assignment um, is a little bit of a warm up. You have to implement a couple of getter and setter methods, all right? Um, but if we, if we look at the code, um, so, so just to familiarize yourself with the code for our simulator here, um, you, you will be writing most of your stuff in the, um, sorry, in the um, process simulator.hpp, uh, well, actually the process simulator.cpp, the implementation file. So I think all the tasks that, that you have to do are in, um, you know, are, are in here. So for example, um, the um, uh, your first ones, like the get next process ID, the get number of active processes, um, those should be getter methods um, in, in the process simulator here. So um, get next process ID. So these are all stubbed out, but then, um, um, you can look at the test. So these should be returning, for example, the, the next process ID that's going to be assigned to the next new process that's created should get returned by getting that process ID. Um, get number of active processes should be the number of processes in the system. Um, and so on. Um, Let me just mention, so you will actually, you will have to make some modifications to the header file for this assignment because um, I didn't give you um, a data structure. So I didn't give you any private variables, uh, any private member variables to actually hold the process control block, okay? So at some point, I think it's after the first task, like after the second task, you have to add something. So at a minimum, you could use like a regular array. So just as kind of more of a hint here than anything. Um, I just say something about this, but but you know, so like we talk about in our chapter three in our lecture videos for this week, um, most operating systems have something which is like a main data structure that that uh, has a list of all the currently running processes being managed by the operating system. So our textbook calls that the process control block, right? So kind of a minimum idea you could do for this is you could have a an array. This is a regular C array of process types. Um, to hold the process control blocks. Or if you're good at memory management, you could use an array of process pointers and dynamically allocate those, okay? Um, so, so by the way, we already gave you a process class which you need to use for this assignment. So besides the process simulator, there's um, um, a process class um, which you can look at.
So processes um, in this simulation don't have a lot of information. Our textbook, you know, describes uh, processes in a real operating system. You need, you need to keep lots and lots of information about the process. But you know, our processes um, that are defined here, you know, we just keep track of the PID, the process identifier, its current state. So the state is defined in the um, process state that HPP file. So processes can, this is just an enumerated type. So processes can be new, ready, running, blocked, or done here. So that's the process state, uh, the, 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 the system time, the simulated time when the process started, the amount, the total amount of time that's been used and the total amount of time that's been used in the current time slice quantum. So this will be where the, um, the number of, of time steps in the current time slice quantum um, are kept track of here. Um, and if the process is blocked, what, what event ID it's waiting on, right? But for the most part, you actually won't be directly kind of using processes like you won't be reading and writing these variables. You'll be creating processes and then calling the public API, the public methods, right? So, so most of the stuff, when you have to use processes, you'll create a process like using this constructor so the normal way you create a process is you tell it what the identifier is, the process ID, and what the time was when that process was created. And that will create and construct a new process for you. And then you use these other methods. So given um, an instance of a process, you can make it ready or you can block it. Um, um, or you can unblock it. So, so you can block it or unblock it, or you can dispatch it um, or time it out by, by calling the appropriate functions, okay? So in your simulation, so for example, when you, when you implement the, the CPU cycle, so um, one thing, so you're gonna be implementing a couple of these uh, methods for the process simulator, uh, including, um, you know, so whenever a CPU, a simulated CPU event cycle occurs, right? So whenever you detect, for example, that um, the, 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 current, the CPU is currently idle, you'll wanna look on your ready queue, um, find the process that's at the front of the ready queue and dispatch it. So call dispatch on that process to um, um, make it the running process, right? And whenever you're running a CPU cycle and you find that the current running process, it's time slice quantum has been exceeded and you can use is time is quantum exceeded to get an answer yes or no, if it's exceeded or not. Um, and if it is exceeded, um, then you want to time it out and so on. All right. So anyway, that, that's just kind of a side. So, so normally, you know, you're going to be um, managing processes, which are these things defined over here in process, I'm sorry, in process.hpp and, and, and uh, the implementations are in the process.cpp file. Um, so besides a process control block, um, uh, you'll, you'll probably need, definitely you'll need like a, a, a ready queue. Um, and again, I encourage you to use, um, um, a, a standard template library. Um, so I have some videos about using standard template library containers like a queue and things, right? So, um, kind of here's a good approach for this. So you, for example, using a standard template library uh, queue, a process identifier. So instead of keeping whole processes, just keeping process identifiers on your queue. Maybe a block list. You, you, again, you, you, know, you may or may not need any or all of these. You probably definitely will need like a queue um, or, or you might wanna use a list instead if, so that you can iterate over this, um, the items in there. Um, but, but you will need um, you probably definitely need a, like a ready queue. You may or may not need a separate data structure to keep like a list of blocked processes. Um, so 
So, oh yeah, to use these, um, of course, you would need to um, include the um, standard template library, um, um, uh, the correct header files, if you want to use a list or a queue or a map or whatever. So. Um, Um, okay, yeah, does there, um, I, th I think that, yeah, I probably need to wrap up here. Um, um, oh, the, it's probably not a good idea to use a magic number. I, um, I will, if, if you can make a simple implementation, again, you could also use something. Um, you know, it, again, it, it might be better to use like a, a, an STL container a vector or a list instead of a regular array to manage your process control block. Um, you know, so one advantage of that is you wouldn't have to statically allocate the array. You could use a list which would allow you to dynamically add on new processes to your process control block um, because you can do that with lists from the standard template library, that kind of thing. Um, but um, as I started saying, um, we do I use an array? Um, I mean, I really shouldn't have shown an example of using a magic number. That's, that's kind of bad. But uh, you can, if you want to use a static array, you can assume, although I would probably like you to create um, uh, a defined constant. Um, so you, you can assume that no more than 100 processes will ever be run in uh, any of these simulations that we test your code with. So you could have a, a, a defined constant like, Say max stimulated processes. So that'd be a little bit better anyway. I mean, yeah, it's not good to, to sprinkle around magic numbers like that. So, um, but but um, but yeah, if you want to use a static array. You can go ahead and assume that there'll be no more than a hundred, so um, you can do that. Although, again, I don't think that's really the best approach, you know. So, uh, static arrays have limitations. So, it really would be good um, to practice using STL containers if you haven't used those in C plus plus before. So, so, so try using like a list or something like that it would would be a better um, idea, most likely. Um, all right, yeah, so um, I think I'm going to go ahead and um, wrap up there. Did uh, anybody have some uh, questions they wanted to ask about on the assignment two or anything here? Now, nope. all right. Um, so yeah, as like some people ask, I'll get this um, uploaded here as soon as I can. Um, yeah, as usual. Yeah, so um, I wasn't able to get into the uh, the the. the I, I do plan on being in the Science 355 for these Monday sessions. Usually, um, I had something going on at the house today, um, but I, I should be there on Monday. But um, you know, feel free to email me um, if you do need a face to face. Feel free to email me. We can set an appointment for that. Um, but yeah, so I think that's it for this session. So I'll go ahead and close it off. Um, and uh, yeah, see you guys later then.